All right, it's going to be a WWE pay-per-view rewind for 2009. Uh, with 2009 right here, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the year. I, I think it's an average year. A lot of good stuff, a lot of really bad stuff. And, um, you know, it's just one of those years that I'm not a huge fan of. But, um, you know, does anyone, like, look back at 2009 like it's the golden era, like this is your favorite year? Uh, I'm curious to know because... It's kind of weird, like like as time goes on, you kind of look back at certain years, like oh, yeah, th th that that was uh, things were so good back then, and you just don't appreciate it at the time. But you know, uh, 2009 to me, I, I would say it's one of the weaker years of the uh, 2000s, and when I say 2000s, I'm referring to 2000 through 2009. Um, I would definitely put it on the bottom half, and I would say that the only years that I will put 2009 above. I, th I think it's a better year than 2006 for the most part as a whole. Uh, I would definitely say it's better than 2007, but 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 that's that's about it to me. I, I love 2004 and 2005 even a lot better than 2009. So, um, so with 2009, let's get right into it. I just wrote down some of the good stuff. Uh, Undertaker and Shawn Michaels from WrestleMania. You know, that, that match single-handedly makes the year better. Uh, the Jeff Hardy and um, CM Punk feud. On SmackDown was pretty awesome. Uh, Jericho's uh, mic skills, particularly, you know, his his greatness carried over into 2009. He just cut a lot of great heel promos on uh, the Legends. You remember they did that whole thing with the uh, the wrestler, the movie The Wrestler came out with Mickey Rourke, and uh, you know the the theme was all these legends were trying to hang on to their uh, you know popularity and fame to get that one last uh, meal ticket. So he cut some great promos on, uh, you know, Roddy Piper, Ricky Steamboat, and guys like that. So, so Jericho did a lot of great mic work on Raw uh, leading up to WrestleMania. Uh, Randy Orton and John Cena. I have to say, I, I think the Orton and Cena feud was pretty good, you know, rewatching it again. It, it wasn't that bad. I, I really thought, you know, once you got past SummerSlam, there was a lot of great storytelling elements between Orton and Cena. I think it was a little bit of oversaturation because they, they kept trying to build build every, each and every one up for a new pay-per-view buy rate. So it got a little bit too much. But, um, yeah, I, 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 so overall, I, I would give the or Orton Cena stuff a thumbs up. Uh, SmackDown, SmackDown was definitely the better brand. Once they had the... Um, the draft lottery after WrestleMania, SmackDown just definitely had better talent. You know, you had Mysterio, Jericho, CM Punk, Jeff Hardy, Edge. It was uh, it definitely had the better wrestlers, the better mic skills, the better show was definitely SmackDown, uh, in my opinion. Raw, uh, for the most part, Raw was pretty much dominated by, um, you know, John Cena, uh, Randy Orton, and uh, you guys know how it went on Raw. And uh, all right, next up, the uh, new talent was pushed at the end of the year. You know, t towards the end of the year, I, I felt like they finally started taking some chances. It just seemed like everyone in the mid-card was just kind of floating around, and they, they really didn't take any chances to kind of elevate anyone other than CM Punk. But when you get to the end of the year, they, they really started pushing a lot of different guys, like Sheamus. Sheamus got a huge uh, victory at Survivor Series, then he won the title. Um, Kofi Kingston... Got a huge push against Randy Orton at the end of the year. Uh, even John Morrison and The Miz, you know, they, they started to take some chances on them. But, um, yeah, man, it, it, just a lot of the talent uh, at the beginning of the year, it, it just seems like they they just didn't know when to pull the trigger in, in regards to when to push a lot of these guys. There's just, there just a lot of hesitancy um, on the WWE's part. Uh, also, yeah, Rey Mysterio. You know, Mysterio is like the dark horse from this year. He really surprised a lot of people. Uh, really got himself back in the great shape and, um, you know, it just made this year better as well. Um, uh, some of the bad stuff, I would say, was the, uh, the WrestleMania main event is my least favorite part of the year. I just hate, you know, WrestleMania main event duds and, uh, you know, Triple H and Randy Orton was just a a bad WrestleMania main event. I thought the the Divas division was really bad. You know, you had some good women's wrestlers like uh you know Beth Phoenix was good. Uh Mickey James was good. Um even Melina, you know, showed some promise, but then you had just some awful divas like Maurice, uh, Michelle McCool, I wasn't a big fan of her, and uh, you just had a lot of garbage uh, divas matches, you know, multi-women's divas matches that just, you know, took up space on pay-per-view and just um, 
or just bathroom break ma matches. I mean, it just watching the, these matches over again, it just makes you appreciate the Divas division or the women's division a lot more now today. Uh, Triple H's dominance. I just felt like Triple H was just kind of losing it. You know, I, I just don't feel like he deserved to be main eventing WrestleMania and, uh, you know, holding the title on pay-per-view after pay-per-view at the beginning of the year. I just I just think uh, Triple H needed to give it up as a full-time wrestler. You know, he was he, he turned 40 years old. To me, he just didn't have it anymore, someone that could go out month after month and, and carry the title. Uh, Edge's injury was, was, a, was, was bad for SmackDown. You know, I, I really thought the Jericho thing with Jericho teaming up with Edge, that was the original plan. I thought that would have been a lot better. Uh, the Matt and Jeff Hardy... Matt Hardy and Jeff Hardy, that storyline, you know, it kind of flopped. You know, I, 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 just, I just don't think it worked with uh, Matt Hardy as a heel. And, uh, you know, the WrestleMania match was just uh, very underwhelming in retrospect. Too many pay-per-views. You know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, th there are so many pay-per-views that they were always, you know, worried about the next one. And, and the, the side effect to that is... You're always getting, uh, you know, bad finishes or, or a finish to build up to the next pay-per-view. And a perfect example of that would be uh, Randy Orton and John Cena from SummerSlam, which has ended up being a mess, just a cluster mess. And, uh, you know, even uh, CM Punk and Jeff Hardy, the finish to the bash was kind of, you know, crappy because they want to set up the next match. And uh, I could go on and on. You know, uh, CM Punk and Undertaker is an another example of them just kind of rushing a finish to set up the Hell in a Cell. So those are a couple examples there. Uh, too many title matches. You know, I, 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 I just think it kind of... Um, it got stale to have the world title defended and the WWE def title defended on every pay-per-view. It just made... Um, it just made for a lot of meaningless title matches it, it just lost both titles i just felt like they lost their importance as the year went on uh degeneration x reunites you know um the dx thing you know it's kind of like jay-z's uh had this one line he's like i i dumbed down my music to double my dollars and uh the wrestling parallel to that would be degeneration x I mean, I, I think, you know, d the early Degeneration X, to me, it wasn't great because they were filthy and, you know, said curse words. To me, I, I thought it was cool because it just felt like, it felt real to me. It felt like, oh, this is the kind of stuff these guys would be doing if they were in the locker room backstage. You know, it, it just felt like that was really them. With this new DX stuff, it just felt a little bit phony. It felt like Triple H was kind of, you know, overplaying to the crowd. Uh, I, I, I just felt like the merchandise thing was... Um, you know, they were trying to appeal to, you know, kids, uh, families, um, little girls. It, it was it was unique because they, they took something that only appealed to adults, but they kind of flipped it and made it a little bit cartoonish. And they were able to, um, you know, appeal to everybody by just not really doing a lot, by just kind of just being uh, friendly and a little bit phony. And for some reason, it just worked. From a financial standpoint, I, I imagine the merchandise worked very well, and um, it was a good way for them to make money without, you know, doing a lot of crazy things. And, and it was an easy way for Shawn Michaels to wrestle tag matches without having to worry about carrying pay-per-views and, you know, putting his body on the line until WrestleMania, which was Shawn Michaels was, you know, trying to, uh, you know, conserve his energy for it. Uh, Legacy doesn't get over. Um, Randy Orton had a, a stable called Legacy with Cody Rhodes and uh, Ted DiBiase Jr. And, you know, to me, I, I just thought it was a, a bad stable. You know, anytime you had Cody and DiBiase out there, I just felt like they couldn't get any heat. You know, I, I, I just don't think they, um, the stable really reached its potential. I think a lot of it had to do with Orton. You know, it, it's funny because or Orton's character only cared about himself. So you just kind of got this impression that character-wise and real-life-wise, I just felt like Orton didn't really do his best to get these guys over. You know, with guys like, uh, with Triple H in Evolution, you know, you, you just remember these quotes that Triple H had, like a Randy Orton, like, the business is in his blood. Or, um, you know, Kurt Angle with Team Angle, he's like, the name of the game is wrestling, and that's what we do best. You know, just little quotes like that, you know, they, they, you kind of remember, like, um, you remember them because, you know, they, you know, Triple H and Angle, for example, you know, really did uh, cut great promos to get the team over. But with Orton, I can't remember a single, a single promo that Orton cut that would, you know, 
help these guys get over. I just didn't, I just didn't think they clicked. You know, the, and, and the legacy thing, the, the theme was they were all, you know, either second generation or third generation uh, superstars. You know, all three of their fathers were involved in professional wrestling. You know, the father, I mean, this, they were the, you know, or, Orton is the son of uh, Cowboy Bob Orton. Um, Cody Rhodes is the son of Dusty Rhodes and DiBiase, obviously, he's the son of the Million Dollar Man. So, uh, Sheamus' title win, you know, you kind of like the fact that they were trying to push new stars, but I think the Sheamus, now it goes back to, you know, do you have, I mean, do you, do you have to uh, deserve the title to actually win the title? Uh, you know, Sheamus kind of falls in line with uh, a Jinder Mahal with this title win right here. I mean, he, he was only, he only wrestled on one pay-per-view at Survivor Series. Uh, they built him up quite nicely, but, um, you know, because it was a tables match with Cena, it was kind of an upset, kind of a fluke victory, and uh, you kind of uh, establish a new star. This, this is like another example of Vince just finding, uh, just kind of tweaking a gimmick and, um, you know, wanting to, uh, you know, put the title on him j just to see how far the character can go. I think sometimes when you create your own character, you're going to be more in favor of putting the title on them because, you know, it's kind of like your creation. And, uh, you know, so I could see why, you know, someone like Vince or even Triple H is a big fan of Sheamus. I think they were workout buddies around that time. So, um, yeah, so Sheamus, I just think all the success that Sheamus had, you know, beating Cena for the title, you know, squashing Daniel Bryan, you know, stuff like that kind of stacked the odds against him. And he's kind of had to redefine his career with Cesaro and, uh, you know, had, had to try to find other ways to get over other than the WWE just kind of force feeding him victories. Uh, not enough. You know, the other part of the year is not enough Undertaker and Shawn Michaels. You know, Taker and Shawn had this classic match at WrestleMania, as we all know. And I, I just feel like they weren't really allowed to capitalize on their momentum because both guys uh, took off after WrestleMania. So, you know, when you, whenever you have a match like that, you know, it's it was such a great match. But in retrospect, it was kind of pointless in terms of um, how valuable it was to the WWE storylines because they were kind of, you know, they both took off until SummerSlam, and by the time you get to SummerSlam, they, they're kind of thrown back into, uh, you know, new feuds where you just kind of, uh, you know, the WrestleMania match didn't really build to anything. So it, it just would have been nice to see if Taker and Shawn had stayed after WrestleMania and see if they could capitalize on the momentum after that match. But, you know, that's just a little gripe right there. But, you know, those are just some positives and negatives. Now we're going to roll right into the uh, MVP candidates. All right, so top 10 MVP candidates for 2009. Uh, I actually cut Triple H from the list, but we'll, we'll talk more about Triple H when we get to the title picture. Uh, number 10, I have Christian. He came in from uh, TNA as Christian Cage. And, you know, so, so Christian was in TNA from 2005, I guess, until the end of 2008, and uh, finally got back to the WWE. See, I, I think Christian made a mistake by leaving to go to TNA. I know, I know Christian, uh, I, th I thought Christian was great for TNA. I, th I thought he did some of the best work in his career in TNA. You know, the stuff with AJ Styles, got, had great matches with uh, Kurt Angle. Uh, just did a lot of great mic work with, uh, you know, TNA. It re really helped TNA grow, uh, Christian. You know, ve very underrated uh, uh, Christian's value to TNA. But I just felt like Christian left in 2005 when he was getting hot. You know, one of the biggest... Uh, one of the biggest uh, flops, not, and it's not really a flop, but, you know, kind of an underutilized feud was the Christian and John Cena feud. You know, the, the feud was, uh, you know, they cut, they cut a lot of great rap battles against each other. And I, I just thought the Christian and Cena dynamic is something that could have been played with until a WrestleMania or, or a SummerSlam. I mean, it could have been such an awesome uh, feud right there. And then Christian, you know, they, they sent him over to SmackDown. He lost to Booker T. And then he, uh, he wanted to leave. He wanted to get time off. Just like Jericho, maybe maybe Jericho kind of influenced his decision there in 2005. I'm not sure, but by the time Christian comes back in 2009, I just felt like it was a little bit too late. It, it was it was it was a little bit too late for Christian. You know, the odds were kind of stacked against him. I felt like they kind of punished him for going to TNA, so they put him in ECW. Now, um, 
it's kind of smart from from a from a financial standpoint to put him on on a third brand ECW because you you're kind of hoping that you could get some of the TNA audience to start watching ECW so they make Christian the ECW champion, which is kind of retarded because at this point you know the guys that they that were main eventing in ECW had nothing to do with ECW they they should have just called this a different show. Uh, I just I just hate the fact that the WWE had this uh, you know ECW brand that just featured guy you know. It, it, it was what it was, and the sad part about it is the product was actually really good. You know, Christian was having really good matches with, uh, you know, Jack Swagger, uh, William Regal. He had an awesome uh, ladder match with uh, Shelton Benjamin at TLC. So Christian really had the eye of the tiger this year and really really was, uh, I would say, definitely the most over guy in the Money in the Bank match. Probably should have won the Money in the Bank, to be honest with you, and uh yeah, I mean, he, he was still good on the mic, too. Did some hilarious stuff at uh, Survivor Series when uh, he was the only white guy on his team. I thought he cut a battle rap there, which was pretty funny. So, yeah, Christian Christian had an underrated year, man. He had, he had some good opponents on ECW. The problem is no one really cared about the ECW title. It was kind of confusing the people that he was in the ECW. It kind of felt like filler. Um, so a lot of people just had a tough time investing in all his matches. He actually wrestled Tommy Dreamer on a lot of the pay-per-views. So that, that kind of kept the ECW spirit alive to a degree. But, uh, yeah, uh, Christian pretty much dominates the ECW title scene. At number nine, I'm going to go with uh, Shawn Michaels. Uh, so, you know, Shawn Michaels started off the year uh, as kind of a slave to JBL. If you guys remember in October 2008, the economy um, went down the drain. You know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not the best guy to be talking about this, but, you know, the, the, the economy uh, was pretty bad at the start of 2009. It, it was pretty much at an all-time low, uh, if you guys remember, or the worst since the Great Depression. So in the storyline, Shawn Michaels needed extra money, so he went to work for JBL because JBL was a... Um, you know, had some good investments. He actually came out with a book called Have More Money Now. So JBL was a good, he, he, he knew um, what kind of stocks to invest in. So, so that was part of the JBL gimmick and the character. So Sean kind of, uh, so, so JBL's plan was for Sean to help him win the world title from uh, John Cena at the Royal Rumble. But Michaels, uh, you know, turned on JBL and, and uh, you know, him and JBL had this all or nothing match at No Way Out. If, uh, you know, if, if JBL... Um, lost he would set Shawn Michaels free but if Shawn Michaels lost then Shawn would be a slave to him forever and uh, would have to work for JBL forever so uh so yeah so Michaels is feuding with JBL before he can move on to The Undertaker and then you know Michaels and Taker you know obviously they rocked the house at Wrestlemania and then when Shawn came back you know he did some funny stuff with uh, DX you know Triple H was getting uh, you know beaten up in handicap matches by uh, Legacy Cody Rhodes and Ted DiBiase so they brought out Shawn Michaels for uh, for SummerSlam and then, and then you know Michaels and uh, Triple H just wrestled in tag matches against Legacy for the rest of the year um and it was what it was man you know I just I just wish Shawn Michaels could have been better utilized it just seemed like Shawn Michaels was saving his energy for WrestleMania, you know, he did a lot of overselling in these DX tag matches with Legacy. Um, you just wish Shawn Michaels could have, uh, you know, been utilized better. You know, the, the the two best matches Shawn Michaels had this year were the WrestleMania match with Taker and the Triple Threat at Survivor Series, which was pretty awesome. Uh, number eight, I'm going to go with the Undertaker. So you know, just like Shawn Michaels, Taker took off until uh, uh, SummerSlam. Uh, after Summers, after CM Punk retained that SummerSlam, Taker came out of nowhere, and it was a great markout moment. The lights went out, and he uh, choke slammed CM Punk. That led to a feud between Taker and uh, Punk, which uh, was a disappointing feud. But the feud definitely had potential. You know, you had two great strikers right there, two guys that um, you know could incorporate some uh, you know MMA and uh, you know you know kickboxing and. You know, just mixed martial arts into a lot of their matches. And, uh, you know, but underwhelming finishes. I, I You know, just, uh, you know, Taker won the title at Hell in a Cell from Punk. You know, I, I, I just think that, you know, I, I think this was a political decision. I, I, I think Shawn Michaels had some influence on it, too. I, I think Shawn probably pitched the idea that, that, that he wanted to screw Taker out of the title right before WrestleMania 26. So... The plan was probably to put the, the belt back on Taker just to, uh, you know, build up towards WrestleMania. But, um, 
you know, it's just kind of, uh, I thought CM Punk's title reign, I'm going to go with CM Punk at number seven. It's a shame because I thought uh, CM Punk's title reign was off to a hot start. He just had that great feud with Hardy. And uh, it's just weird. It, it was weird how CM Punk and Undertaker opened up Hell in a Cell. And, uh, you know, Punk just loses the title to take her in the first match on a pay-per-view. It just, you know, it's just that's not normally the way you would do things. You know, if you have this hot heel, you have him lose clean to The Undertaker. And, you know, that's it. He doesn't really get another title shot again. Now, th there's rumors that CM Punk, like, he... Um, he uh, he disobeyed or or, or you know did, did didn't abide by the dress code. I don't know if that was it. And there's rumors that him and Taker didn't get along. So I I don't know what the exact issue was. You know, whenever you have a, a hot heel that loses the title clean, you figure you know something happened backstage. But you know, punk punk, punk had a you know kind of a hot and cold year. You know, when he won, he actually won the Money in the Bank ladder match at WrestleMania. And when he won, a lot of the fans were booing him. He got booed the next night on Raw. And uh, True Slayer talked about this, and I, I completely agree. I, I think a lot of the booing kind of had to do with how he was booked in 2008. It was kind of tough for the fans to get to get excited over someone that, uh, you know, he won the title and then he doesn't main event, you know, SummerSlam. And, you know, he gets taken out by Randy Orton. So they, they kind of looked... They kind of looked at Punk like, you're going to win the money in the bank, and, you know, what are you going to really do with it? You know, like, how how are we how are we to expect that this title reign is going to be any different than last time? So I, I think that's how some people looked at it. It wasn't anything that, that Punk did wrong. I, I think Punk was still kind of experimenting with his look. You know, his, his look wasn't great yet. I don't think the long hair really suited him well. You know, his physique isn't quite what it became. Um, I just, I just think he, um, he was a little bit uncomfortable at certain points around this time, but I think the Jeff Hardy feud and him turning heel on Hardy is what kind of really awoken the beast. And you, you saw some flashbacks to when, you know, CM Punk was in Ring of Honor and he was able to cut these really comfortable, uh, you know, heel promos, which had a lot of realism to it. So at number six, I'm going to go with, uh, Jeff Hardy. You know, the, the problem with the, um, you know, Jeff Hardy and Matt Hardy feud, it's funny, you know, a lot of the brothers versus brothers feuds, you know, didn't really pan out. You know, the, the gold standard would be the Bret Hart, Owen Hart one, you know, but Edge and Christian, I thought that kind of flopped because it was kind of rushed because it was during the invasion. But, you know, with Jeff Hardy and Matt Hardy, um, I, I don't know, I, 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 I'm assuming the, uh, the, you know, the broken Matt Hardy and the brother Nero stuff seems like it went over a lot well. That, than this one. They had a feud in uh, 2001 as well, but it wasn't like a full-blown heel turn for Matt. So with Matt Hardy right here, this was a full-blown heel turn. He cost Jeff Hardy the title at the Royal Rumble uh, when he faced Edge. So Edge won the title back at the Rumble. And, uh, you know, Matt Hardy clocked Jeff with the steel chair. And th they just had Matt Hardy do these things that really wasn't believable. Like they, they I, I think he tried to run Jeff Hardy over, tried to burn him with pyro. Uh, I, I think he tried to burn his house down and, and kill his dog at the same time, which is really sad. But, you know, I, I just don't think anyone could buy into it. You know, no one could buy into the fact that the Hardys really, you know, hated each other to that degree. And I don't think Matt is like that type of heel. I think Matt Hardy's better as, I don't want to say chicken shit heel, but, you know, like the Matt Hardy version one, you know, a Matt Hardy heel with a little bit more character, a little bit more personality. Um... You know, more of a cocky heel. You know, the version one Matt Hardy, which I thought was kind of underutilized. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I just couldn't buy into it. And then when you get to WrestleMania, you know, if, if you, know, you got two guys that are supposed to kill each other. And then you got like Jeff Hardy bringing out ladders and, you know, bringing out two ladders at the same time. And, you know, kind of, you know, jumping over one ladder to get to the next ladder. It's just if you really hate someone, you're not going to bring out ladders and, and, you know, jump off the top of them. It just, I don't know. I just don't think that match worked from a psychology standpoint. Uh, it also felt very rushed considering how many like, you know, foreign weapons they use and how many spots it had. Uh, you know, it just didn't go over that well. So I think, you know, maybe down the road, uh, Jeff Hardy and Matt Hardy could have the feud that we, uh, we all envisioned them having. Um, so we'll see what happens there. At number five, I'm going to go with edge. So edge actually tore his Achilles, uh, in the summertime, which was a shame because, uh, you know, Edge and Jericho, 
were on the verge of just having this awesome tag team heel reign and bringing credibility back to the uh, tag team titles. I, I actually like it when you got main eventers uh, that, that team up together and get back into the tag division. I would love for the WWE to do like a, uh, a tag team title tournament featuring like main eventers just like tagging up together. Um, I, I love to see that down the road. But yeah, Edge and Jericho. Thought that would have been an awesome team right here. But, uh, but you know, Edge had a great year. You know, he was really getting over as the year went on. You know, just a great year as a heel. Um, you know, won the title back at the Rumble. And then he lost the title at the Elimination Chamber. Then won it back at the Raw Elimination Chamber. Heads into WrestleMania as, uh, cha- as the, uh, you know, world champion. That's the other problem with the year. The uh, the brands weren't distinguished. They kept on having these super shows. So by the time you get to WrestleMania, you basically have two champions on Raw. So I wasn't a big fan of what they did with Vicky Guerrero. They had like Vicky Guerrero, um, you know, um, you know, having an affair with the Big Show. That was kind of silly right there. But 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 Edge was was a he was an over heel. He was a heel that was getting face reactions and. Um, yeah, you know, just uh, promo wise and character wise, you know, Edge was, uh, you know, Ed, Ed, Edge was having one of the best years of his career, without a doubt. But uh, you know, after losing the, the championship to Jeff Hardy at Extreme Rules, he was going to take a back seat and dominate the tag team division with Jericho. And uh, you know, you know, him getting injured definitely, um, you know, made the year worse. Um, you know, he had a great few with, um, he had, you know, they kind of went back to uh, John Cena after WrestleMania. And they had a uh, last man standing match. So number four, I'm actually going to go with John Cena. Uh, so Cena in 2009 was, um, yeah, you know, just 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 an- another solid year for uh, for John Cena. You know, wins the title back at WrestleMania uh, once again. You know, you give Cena credit because you know people bitch about how. Oh, you know, you couldn't really follow Undertaker and Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania. But, you know, John Cena went out there um, right after them. And, you know, his his match still got a great reaction, even though Triple H Norton didn't. So, you know, say what you want about Cena. But, you know, the, the, the crowd reactions and, uh, you know, no matter where you put him on the card, he always got a great reaction. Um, you know, he, he had some really boring matches with the Big Show. These are probably the worst matches I've seen Cena have. You know, him and, him and Big Show had some, uh, you know, submission matches. Uh, that really, that a submission match at Extreme Rules, uh, the really, really slow burn. But, um, you know, they, they kind of used uh, Big Show to put Cena over. Uh, what does Cena do at SummerSlam? Yeah, so, and, and then, see, you know, I, th- I thought Cena and Orton was uh, was a really great feud. You know, it, it, it was, I think it's what Cena needed. He needed another hot heel to really... Um, to really just get him over once again, you know, I, I thought Orton did a great job of uh, you know putting Cena over. They just they just had a lot of great storytelling matches, I would say. Even though the SummerSlam match was was definitely a clusterfuck, man. They, the, their next couple of matches really had some uh, some good storytelling elements. Uh, number three, I'm actually going to go with Rey Mysterio. So uh, so yeah, man, Mysterio really got himself into great shape. If if you guys remember at SummerSlam. 2007 when uh, Mysterio came back he he took some criticism for being a little bit too pudgy and uh but you know this year he got himself into just awesome awesome shape his his performance was great at the Rumble the Elimination Chamber him and Jericho and Edge tore it up in that Raw Elimination Chamber uh then he won the Intercontinental Championship from JBL at WrestleMania in somewhat of a squash match then he just had this epic series of matches with uh, Jericho at, uh, you know, Judgment Day, Extreme Rules, where Jericho takes the mask off. And then at the Bash, uh, you know, Mysterio wore the double mask and uh, surprised Jericho with the victory at the Bash. So each and every one of those matches got better and better. And then he, uh, you know, had some great, great matches with Ziggler and Night of Champions and SummerSlam. Um, then he started teaming up with Batista. Then Batista turns heel. Uh, on Mysterio at the end of the year uh, it was de- desperately needed. So, you know, Mysterio and Batista were like big brother, little brother. And, you know, they, they had a fatal four-way at bragging rights for the title. And, uh, you know, Mysterio accident, you know, he, he, you know, Batista, you know, thought Mysterio cost him the match. So that's when Batista turned on him and just power bombed the crap out of Ray. And, uh, you know, heel Batista was definitely needed because, you know, Batista kept getting injured and injured. And, uh, but, you know, overall, man, Mysterio had a, a, a great year. You know, there was a lot of debate about whether Mysterio should be MVP. 
uh, I, on YouTube when we were discussing MVP of 2009. Uh, number two, I'm going to go with Randy Orton. So, man, you know, Orton just had a great year um, uh, in terms of his character. You know, he was, um, if you remember in 2008, he actually got hurt by Triple H. Uh, he actually tore his uh, shoulder or broke his shoulder. I believe it was at Extreme Rules. So Orton comes back at the end of 2008, takes out CM Punk. And then this leads to this big, uh, you know, really determined to get Orton over as this monster heel. He, uh, you know, kicks McMahon in the skull. He kisses Stephanie, handcuffs her, uh, you know, the, destroys Shane McMahon at No Way Out. And uh, the plan was to take out the whole McMahon, Triple H family because, you know, th this goes back to when Triple H turned on him in evolution and uh orton finally wanted to get his revenge i i, I like the concept uh I, I i could see what they were going for here but at the same time uh for for triple h and orton to main event wrestlemania it, it i i just think it was a mistake because it's a it's a feud that was done in 2008 and um you know you we've seen both guys wrestle countless time and time again and, uh, you know, it just, um, as a main event of WrestleMania, it just wasn't going to work. Even though, from a storytelling standpoint, I completely understand what they were going for. But, yeah, uh, you know, give Orton credit. I thought his heel work was great. His facial expressions were really good throughout the year. Uh, I, even with John Cena, a lot of those matches, he just played an awesome, awesome heel where um, uh, he, he, just, he just did a lot of things that just made you um, really feel like he was evil. You know, he really did. He, you know, you know, handcuffing John Cena, you know, hit, hitting the crap out of him with a cane. Um, you know, just everything was just very methodical. Um, just just very, very cold, very sadistic. Um, you know, I, 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 you could even you could argue that Orton was if it wasn't for the main event of WrestleMania, I, I might even give Orton the MVP that that's how good of a year I thought he had. Um, just. A lot of underwhelming main events with Triple H and Batista, you know, cost him the MVP. At number one, I'm going to go with Chris Jericho. Uh, so we have back-to-back -back MVPs for, for Jericho. Jericho was the MVP of 2008 and 2009. I, I still defend Jericho as MVP of 2009. Even though he, he didn't really main event a lot of pay-per-views, Jericho, other than TLC with Jericho. Um, you know, he, he, you know, him and Ray, no, the reason he's the MVP is because of the matches with Mysterio, the matches that Jericho Mysterio had were the best matches of the year, Judgment Day, Extreme Rules and The Bash. That was a great trilogy, great storytelling, great matches on SmackDown, uh, Jericho's mic skills heading into WrestleMania with, um, you know, the promos on, uh, Roddy Piper, um, you know, Jimmy Superfly Snuka and, and Steamboat, you know, yeah, he actually had a great, a great sequence of, uh, you know, matches with, uh, with Steamboat going in the rest at WrestleMania, actually, you know, it was like, it, it was great because Jericho was able to wrestle his idol at WrestleMania. I mean, it was incredible. You know, he, he grew up, you know, idolizing Ricky Steamboat, you know, he, WrestleMania three is Jericho's favorite match of all time. And, you know, 20 years later, they actually being in the ring with the guy that inspired you to get into the business, you know, that, that was, you know, that was a really cool moment. Um, for Jericho and then he actually wrestled Steamboat at Backlash in a singles match so um so yeah yeah and then the Mysterio stuff was great you know him and him and Edge could have had a a great tag team run but uh you know Jericho teaming up with the Big Show uh they won the tag team titles they they had some they had a lot of average matches none of their matches were great they actually faced Legacy they faced uh Mysterio and uh Batista they faced MVP and Mark Henry, and then they, they faced Degeneration X, Triple H, and Shawn Michaels at TLC, where they dropped the tag titles to uh, to DX at TLC in the main event. Um, but, you know, I, I thought Jericho, uh, Jericho loves his uh, stuff with the big show. You know, they didn't want to sell any merchandise. They wanted to be the top heels of the company. Um, it, it really made Jericho a strong heel to, you know, boss around the big show and uh you know the big show didn't have any problem you know taking orders from jericho so the tag team just worked you know they they even did some creative things in their matches particularly at tlc as well i thought they, they did some really creative things where you know jericho's on top of uh big show's shoulders and is trying to go for the uh the world titles so it, even even their tag matches they, they did some nice tag team work together uh without a doubt so uh so yeah and also uh J J they have bragging rice they had a raw versus smackdown match and Jericho actually uh, captained SmackDown uh, to the victory after Big Show actually turned on Raw 
and choke slam Kofi Kingston off the top rope. And uh, yeah, Kofi Kingston is another one that I thought had a good year as well. I was debating on putting him in my uh, MVP candidates, but uh, yeah, shout out to Kofi Kingston, man. Really underrated worker right there. This this might have been Kofi's uh, best year. You know, because he had that feud with Orton where he took Orton out of Madison Square Garden, uh, you know, leg dropped him through a table. That was a really good feud as well. So, you know, I'm probably leaving some other stuff out that was good. Um, so so next up for this video, I just want to uh, uh, touch on the WWE title picture because the WWE title picture is a little bit confusing uh, looking back on it. So let's just start with the WWE title picture um, to start the video. So, yeah. So first it's on SmackDown. So you have, uh, you know, Matt Hardy screwing Jeff Hardy out of the WWE title at the Rumble. And Edge becomes, uh, you know, champion at the Rumble. Edge defends the, the WWE title at No Way Out. At the time, the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view was still called No Way Out. So, so Edge actually gets small packets by Jeff Hardy at the beginning of the Chamber and loses the uh, WWE title in the Chamber match. Uh, Triple H actually wins it back. Um, you know, by uh, lastly defeating The Undertaker to win the WWE title back. So Triple H is champion heading into WrestleMania. He has the big feud with uh, Randy Orton. And Triple H and Orton have uh, this lackluster, really boring uh, match at WrestleMania. You know, they just couldn't follow Taker and Michaels. But uh, I don't think it was the right pick. I, I don't think either guy was uh, really over. And, you know, th this was a case where you would send the fans home happy. If uh, if Orton won it as a heel, you know, Orton was red hot as a heel. And, uh, you know, for them not to give Orton the title them there was, was a big mistake. I think that would have been, you know, the victory that would have put sent Orton to the next level. And, you know, to me, you know, Orton not winning that match really affected him. I think there's a reason why you don't see Orton in these big time. I mean, look, look how long it took for Randy Orton to face Brock Lesnar. When they did it, it just kind of felt like they did it because they had nothing else to do. Uh, Randy Orton in The Rock hasn't even been talked about as a dream match. That should have been a dream match when The Rock came back. But it wasn't even, you know, it wasn't even discussed. And I think, you know, because of stuff like this, I don't think Orton was able to get to that, you know, upper tier. You know, I, obviously Orton's an all-time great, but I don't think he's ever going to be considered among the greats like a Cena you know, Hogan, Rock, Austin, you know, that type of level. But I think a victory over Triple H main event of WrestleMania right there, I, I think that would have been the right call. Uh, so a backlash, Triple H uh, loses the title after Randy Orton punts him in a six-man tag match. So basically, if anyone from Orton's team, with which was Legacy, uh, Cody Rose and Ted DiBiase, if anyone uh, pinned anyone on Triple H's team, which was Shane McMahon and Batista and Triple H, they would win the title. So Orton actually, uh, you know, punched Triple H. Uh, Triple H is out of action for a couple months. So Batista comes back and wants his revenge on Orton for punting him in the skull back in 2008. So, uh, so yeah, so Orton and Batista had these really bad matches, just bad finishes. You know, the Judgment Day match ended in a DQ. Then Batista got hurt. So to keep Batista looking strong, they actually had Batista win the title back in a steel cage match at Extreme Rules, which lasted like under 10 minutes. So Batista actually vacates the title on Raw, and uh, Orton actually wins the title back in a fatal four-way for the vacant title. Uh, fatal four-way with Orton, Triple H, Big Show, and Cena. And uh, Orton actually hits the RKO on Big Show to win the title back. So when we get to the bash, uh, Triple H and Orton have a three stages of hell uh, directed by Vince McMahon. Vin Vince, obviously at the time, Orton had punted Vince in the skull. See, you know, I, I, at this time, the business was so exposed that I, I don't, who the fuck is going to cheer for Triple H as a babyface when he has Shane and Vince McMahon on his side and Stephanie? It just wasn't going to work. And, uh, you know, I just, I hate that pay-per-view main event right there at the bash. I, I just don't think it was that good. Three stages of hell. First, uh, first was a wrestling match. Second was a false count anywhere match. But, you know, they, the, for the bulk of the match ended up being a stretcher match. Crappy finish. You know, you order a pay-per-view and you have legacy help, uh, you know, Orton retain the title. But still, you know, Triple H takes out legacy with a sledgehammer and still is posing while all three members of, Le members of legacy are left laying on the floor it just i don't know i just thought it was a crappy main event and uh you know i at this time people just couldn't buy triple h as a baby face he wasn't getting booed 
But you know, you know, like like let's give Triple H credit. Like the fans never really turned on him as a babyface. Like deafeningly. I mean, there was some na 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 goodbye chants when Orton pump pump punted him in the skull at Backlash, but nothing like Cena like. Like he he didn't get any like Cena like you know heat. Uh, you know the the worst heat I've ever seen Triple H get as a heel. Uh, what like hated heat would be SummerSlam 2003, the uh, Goldberg Elimination Chamber match. Uh, but let me see, yeah, Orton's still champion here. Uh, Million Dollar Man was like a guest guy on. Uh, he was he was a guest host on Raw, and he uh, or Orton tried to. Um, Orton, uh, you know, interrupted a Triple H uh, John Cena number one contenders match. So a uh, Million Dollar Man made Night of Champions a three way match. With Orton, Cena, and Triple H. So that's a rematch from WrestleMania 24 at Night of Champions. And uh, Randy Orton uh, retains the title there. And so from there we go into the, uh, you know, Randy Orton, John Cena overload. So I, I fucking hate the match at SummerSlam. This, this is what they do. Orton and Cena had a great crowd. Great match. I mean, the match is going along fine. And then they just, uh, you know, book this thing to shreds. Uh, so or Orton's trying to play the chicken shit heel, which which never works from a financial standpoint. And, uh, you know, it tries to get himself counted out, tries to get himself disqualified. And then they have uh, Lillian Garcia just get on the mic and say from direct. You see, you got to if you're going to do this, you got to bring Vince out to, to at least give this a chance to work. You know, bring him out. So they just had, as direct orders from Vince McMahon, this match is going to restart. I guess Vince just wasn't there. Um, you know, you know, v Vince and Orton were kind of feuding throughout the whole year, if you think about it. So it does make sense. But to have Lillian Garcia, who actually botched it, and for her to keep on saying restart the match, it just made it look silly. I just wasn't a big fan of it. And, uh, and there was actually a fan that ran in to keep Cena from winning. Um, actually, it wasn't a fan. I, I mean, I, I think everyone bought into it being a fan, but it was actually a, a friend of uh, Ted DiBiase that came in and uh, screwed uh, you know Cena out of the match. So, so Orton retains at SummerSlam, which was just a clusterfuck of a match. Could have went so well. The, the, this is probably a classic. The most, the, mo the a perfect example of a classic uh, could have been classic match. That was botched. And then from there, you, you get some great stuff between Cena and Orton. I, I would say that the breaking point match, the submission match, had a lot of great storytelling elements with, uh, you know, Orton just played a monster heel where he handcuffed Cena. Just started, you know, just, you know, swinging the crap out of him with the kendo stick. You had you had these scars on Cena's stomach. And just to see Cena get out of that was just, uh, you know, crazy. Just, just great drama, great storytelling. So Cena makes Orton tap out with the handcuffs, uses the handcuffs to make C Cena tap out with the STFU, a ver modified version of the STFU. So Cena wins the title back. Uh, Hell in a Cell, Orton kicks uh, Cena in the skull. And uh, kind of wrestles a very methodical Hell in a Cell style match, but it was still good. It was still effective. So Orton wins the title back at Hell in a Cell, and then Cena wins it back at Bragging Rights. Uh, stipulation was that if Cena lost, he would have to, uh, you know, go to Friday. They call it Friday Night SmackDown at the time. And um, so yeah, so C Cena and Orton had this anything goes uh, Iron Man match at Bragging Rights, which was really good. You know, I I've been on record saying that this might have been the worst Iron Man match, but um, you know, I, I would say may maybe this is better than Benoit and Triple H. Looking back on it, I I, th I thought it was that good. You know, th there's some stuff I don't really care for with Orton playing with the pyro. He tried to set Cena on fire, you know, playing with the pyro, but you know, it wasn't that bad. You know, it was it was. Um, it was just Orton trying to do anything he could to, to, to kill Cena. It was kind of brutal, too. Kind of scary stuff. Think about it. You know, at least it was something different. At the time, I thought it was a little bit too, uh, I don't know what the word is. Uh, kind of over the top. But, uh, you know, just good drama at the end. You know, uh, Cena actually makes Orton tap out of the five-second mark. I think both guys are tied like five to five. And, uh, see, the one cr criticism of the match, so I, th I thought they kind of... Uh, See, people call the Brett and Sean match a little bit boring because there's no, you know, falls. I, th I think, you know, when you do all these, uh, you know, pinfalls, I think it was like five to five and then Cena won six to five. When you do all these pinfalls, it's kind of an easy way out 
to keep the fans invested. But in this particular match, you know, you got John Cena out there. You know, I think Cena can keep the fans engaged no matter where he is on the card and no matter how long his matches go. So, but yeah, man, the, the Iron Man match, anything goes. You just had a lot of creative spots. Uh, the, the table spot was, was pretty awesome there. And uh, they did a lot of... A lot of cool stuff with the pyro and um, you know, just, just a lot of um, a lot of vicious bumps there. So uh, yeah, yeah, really, really good stuff. I think people forget about how how good that Iron Man ma match was. I mean, it was a little bit too much oversaturation with Cena and Orton. You know, four pay per views in a row. But I have to say, other than SummerSlam, the booking and the matches were pretty good. Um, so Cena Cena wins it back and then he retains at Survivor Series. They do a DX for Cena. Uh, you know, triple threat match of Survivor Series with uh, Sean, Triple H, and Cena, which was, uh, you know, good stuff, man. Uh, Shawn Michaels really, uh, I have to say, he, he, he really was able to, you know, bring a lot of brains to a lot of his matches. He really, really tried to make each and every one of his, uh, you know, singles matches different. And uh, I, I just thought it was kind of shocking how he super kicks Triple H at the beginning of the match. And then, you know, Triple H takes Sean out, puts him through the table. So you have that back and forth between DX, which is pretty cool. But, uh, yeah, just some innovative counters with the super kick pedigree, you know, added to the adjustment. Just to see all three guys, you know, counter off of those uh, finishing maneuvers. And just, just a lot of good stuff there. So that was a great triple threat match where Cena retains... And then he loses to Sheamus. So they built up Sheamus very well at Survivor Series. And then Sheamus actually wins the WWE title in a tables match at TLC, which is kind of a fluke. You know, they, they, they tried to build this as an upset. It was an upset, but, you know, it, it keeps Cena looking strong because they, they kind of made it look like he lost his balance as he went through the table. And it was a great way to establish Sheamus as a, uh, you know, a major player, if that's what they were going for. But, you know, I just think things like giving the, this Sheamus the title a little bit too soon kind of hurt the credibility of the title. And it, it, it kind of hurt Sheamus' career in the long run. But you can see what they were doing. You know, it, it's, it's funny because everyone's saying the WWE needs to build new stars. How are you supposed to build new stars with Triple H posing over uh, the whole stable at the end of the pay-per-view? But then when you do give a guy uh, the world title, you know, you got a lot of people bitching as well. So it, it's tough to make everybody happy. So it is what it is. Uh, yeah, so that was a WWE title picture. So let me go to the uh, world title picture. I'll try to cover this up very quickly. Uh, world title picture. Um, so Cena's the world champion on Raw. If you guys remember, he beat Jericho at Survivor Series to win the world title. So he goes in the Rumble, uh, retains over JBL with the help of Shawn Michaels. When you get to No Way Out, the Elimination Chamber, uh, Cena actually gets upset at the Elimination Chamber. It gets pinned by Edge. As soon as he gets into the chamber match, which was shocking, I have to say, it was very, very shocking. And, um, you know, it, it's funny because No Way Out, it, it had you so intrigued with the world title scene going into WrestleMania. Like, oh, man, what are they going to do? You know, Cena lost the title. Um, you know, uh, well, I, th I think Triple H won it back. Um, so, so, so you had Edge and Triple H going into WrestleMania as champions. But... You know, I, I just felt like at WrestleMania, you had so much intrigue with the uh, world title scene because of what happened at No Way Out. And then by the time you get to WrestleMania, you know, both both uh, championship matches kind of fell flat. So, uh, so yeah. So, Edge goes in the champion and um, goes, in, goes into WrestleMania as champion. If you remember, he... Um, he lost the WWE title in the opening chamber match. And then in the main event of No Way Out, he attacks Kofi Kingston and locks himself inside the chamber. And, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is the fantasy of the WWE right here. If this was a real sport, obviously, you take him out of the chamber. But he locked himself into the chamber, so you couldn't take him out of the match. So he replaced Kofi Kingston. And, uh, you know, Edge pins Cena with the spear and goes over Mysterio in the end to win the world title. So, you know, I, I got to give it to WWE. That was pretty creative booking. And then you had this awful soap opera, you know, kind of childish storyline between Cena, Big Show, and, Ed, and Edge, which was kind of, uh, you know, like a love triangle over Vicky Guerrero. You know, you know, John Cena borrowed that Adam Sandler line. He's like, oh, Vicky, you got some explaining to do. So, uh, yeah, I wasn't a big fan. You see, I think a, a championship match at WrestleMania needs to be more serious than what, what we got there. So, you know, Cena wins it back. He, uh, he, he um, does an attitude adjustment to the big show and then attitude adjustments 
Edge on top of the big show. You got you got an okay WrestleMania match right there. Good entrance from Cena. Uh, I just think WrestleMania should have been one on one. I'll talk more about WrestleMania be- uh, a little bit later. Uh, so Edge wins the title back in the last man standing match at Backlash. Uh, that's when Big Show comes out, screws uh, John Cena, and puts him through the spotlight, which is crazy. That was a crazy bump right there. Um, you know, the pyro went off, which made it look even better. So, yeah, just uh, that, that might have been the most vicious bump I've ever seen Tina, Cena take at Backlash. Uh, so from Backlash, Edge moves on to Judgment Day, where he defends the title against Jeff Hardy. Successfully retains as Matt Hardy screws Jeff Hardy again at Judgment, at Judgment Day. I think Jeff actually beat Matt in a stretcher match to end the feud on SmackDown. So uh, the Edge and Jeff Hardy feud continues in the Extreme Rules where Jeff Hardy actually uh, defeats Edge in an awesome ladder match uh, to win the world title. And then CM Punk comes out and cashes in his money in the bank. He actually, he actually hits uh, Jeff with the go-to-sleep, but Jeff actually kicks out. And, man, Punk's facial expression on that, that first go-to-sleep when Jeff, Jeff kicks out was pretty awesome. And uh, hits him with another go-to-sleep. And, uh, you know, Punk actually wins the uh, world title. And uh, I, I don't think Punk officially turned heel until after the bash. So by the time you get to the bash, um, Jeff and Punk had this uh, match where, uh, you know, Punk actually got elbowed in the eye. And he was he was selling it so bad that the referee stopped the match because, uh, you know, Punk thought he lost his eye or whatever. And, uh, you know, Jeff was upset about that. And, you know, Jeff kicked, uh, you know, Punk's ass after the match was over, even though, you know, P- Punk couldn't even see. So, so that, that, that was cool booking right there. It kind of made Punk look like this cowardly heel. Um, you know, even though he's the one that got hurt, it looked like he lost his eye. You know, it, j- it just it just made him look like a cowardly heel, and it, it it definitely set the tone for CM Punk's heel turn. Then you have Punk delivering these great lines to Jeff about how many times you know Jeff has been suspended, or that he's drug free, alcohol free, and you know Punk cut these great promos on uh, you know the parents of the WWE for supporting Jeff Hardy and buying the merchandise, and uh, you know taking the easy way out is supporting Jeff Hardy. So. Uh, so Jeff actually beats Punk at Night of Champions with the, uh, you know, Swanton Splash, Swanton Bomb. Uh, you know, got a good match right there, nothing spectacular. But then Punk and Hardy go out there in the main event of TLC. And, uh, you know, they just rock the house. You know, creative spots. Um, nothing crazy or over the top. But each and every spot had a big impact because, you know, they timed everything out very well. And uh wasn't just a spot fest. You know, it did it definitely did have the big spot with Jeff doing the Swanton off the top of the ladder at the end of it. But uh, you know, Punk uh Punk wins the title back, just kind of punching Jeff off the ladder, and uh Undertaker comes out and choke slams Punk as uh the lights go off, and then you, you have the whole punk and uh Undertaker fiasco at breaking point and hell in a cell. Uh so they, they do a finish at breaking point, which is actually in Montreal. It's in Montreal, so they do uh, kind of a screw job finish where uh, Undertaker actually makes Punk tap out to the Hell's Gate. And then uh, Teddy Long comes out and says, oh, Vicky Guerrero banned the Hell's Gate back in 2008 when uh, when Edge was actually actually started bleeding from the Hell's Gate. So Vicky actually banned it back in 2008. And uh, Teddy Long said that still stands. And uh, I don't know. They, they seemed like they were kind of playing with. Uh, I don't know if Teddy Long officially turned heel, but it seemed like they were kind of playing with it just to screw with Undertaker. So Punk comes back into the ring and uh, puts Taker in the Anaconda Vice, and then they ring the bell before Taker even has a chance to tap. And uh, and so p- that's how Punk retains that breaking point. You know, they're in Montreal, so they went for like a Montreal finish. Uh, yeah, it's just that's an example of them just having too many pay per views. So they they use that to build up to the Hell in a Cell. Then by the time you get to Hell in a Cell, you know Taker and Punk have this rushed short Hell in a Cell match in the opening, which had a, you know which was good while it lasted. But by the time it ends, you're just like, why did they take the title off of Punk? And in Punk was uh, you know. You know, right there, you have 2008 and 2009. Punk wins the Money in the Bank, wins the world title. But, you know, each time Punk lost the belt, it's just kind of like, that's how you lose it. You know, you lo- you know lost it to when Orton kicked him in the skull, had to vacate it when they did that, that scramble match at uh, Unforgiven. That was back in 2008. And then, you know, you kind of just, it seemed like he kind of got semi-squashed by The Undertaker in the opening match at Hell in a Cell. So so there we go with that. I, I just think Undertaker, 
they decided that they wanted Taker and Sean to main event WrestleMania, and I, I think Sean probably pitched the idea of let me screw Taker out of the title so he could get his revenge at WrestleMania. I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure something like that was talked about around that time. So Taker actually retains, uh, you know, at bragging rights in a fatal four way when Batista and Ray turned on each other. Uh, what, what else happened? Then he retained in a triple threat match with Jericho and the Big Show at a Survivor Series. I just thought Big Show brought that match down. I I really thought they should have did a, done a program with Jericho and Undertaker one-on-one on pay-per-view. I think they had a match on SmackDown. And then TLC was kind of a clusterfuck of a booking match where they had Batista win the title by low-blowing Taker in a chairs match. But then Teddy Long came out and said, you're not going to win the title by low-blow. And then Taker, you know, tombstones him and wins the title, and, you know, retains the title in a chairs match. So Taker goes into 2010 as the world heavyweight champion, the reaper of souls. He, he called the world title hol- the holy grail. Uh, so there we go. So, so you have Undertaker as world champion heading into 2010. And WWE champion was actually Sheamus heading into 2010. So that that's just to clear up the world title picture for anyone that, uh, you know, remembers it. Uh, so let, let's talk about the, uh, you know, the pay-per-view quality really quickly. Um, I would say the best pay-per-view of the year was, without a doubt, No Way Out. You know, two great Elimination Chamber pay-per-views. I, w- I would say that's, that's definitely the pay-per-view of the year. You also had Shane McMahon and Randy Orton on that show as well. Um, really, by, by far, I would say, I don't think anything really came close. I thought Survivor Series was a great show because they pushed new talent and you had two good world title matches, especially a great main event with DX and Cena. Uh, so that's it. Those are really the only two pay-per-views I would call great. I would say that TLC at the end of the year was a really fun show. You know, it's something that I didn't appreciate at the time. I think everyone was kind of shocked at the booking of the show. But I would say, you know, TLC definitely had a, a you know, a, a really, really fun show. Even though people do hate the gimmick pay-per-views. Um, a lot of average pay-per-views, man. Just a lot of average. Uh, Royal Rumble. Randy Orton actually wins the Royal Rumble. Lastly, it defeats, defeats Triple H with the help of Legacy. But the the rumble was uh, I, I would say it was good. It was just it was good, but not great. Uh, WrestleMania had Taker and Shawn Michaels, which helps the show. But overall, man, I I, I just think WrestleMania could have been so much better. I think this could have been an all time great WrestleMania. I think um, I th- I think you know Cena Cena should have main evented WrestleMania. Either Cena or Jeff Hardy should have main evented. See, here would be my choice. I, I think Jericho should have stayed champion and have uh, you know Jericho and Cena main event WrestleMania. I think that would have been a better choice. I think uh, you know Jeff Hardy and Triple H they could have had their blow off feud or blow off match to their feud in an undercard match at WrestleMania. I think uh, you know if you want to have Randy Orton face anyone at WrestleMania, I think Edge would have been the way to go. So you have Orton, Edge, Cena, Jericho, Jeff Hardy, Triple H. Taker Shawn Michaels. I think that's a killer four man main event. So that that would have been my choice. But you know, man, I just think uh, you know, either Cena or Hardy. Uh maybe even Jeff Hardy versus John Cena. I thought that would have been a better choice. But um, you know, Triple H and Randy Orton, they the the crowd was just not there. And uh it was just a poor choice to main event WrestleMania. I I think I've said everything I needed to say about it. You know, Triple H is a baby face. Um I, I I just don't see how how this was gonna work. If you want a, a mega face to get monsterly over uh, at uh, at WrestleMania and winning and retaining the title, I I don't know, man. I, I I've we've dissected it and talked about it for years, and uh, yeah, this this was just such a wasted opportunity uh, right here. And the the other thing is, you didn't really know how Taker and Sean, you didn't know how good that was gonna be. Maybe they weren't anticipating, you know, them creating like greatest WrestleMania of all time standards. So maybe they just weren't prepared for it. And the other thing is, too, like with the booking of the match, too, like they they sold this match like they hated each other. And then they go out there and you know, they kind of wrestled a, a slow paced, you know, very methodical, boring style of a match. Uh, if it, it should have been a war and uh, it, it it just wasn't, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, the, the people have talked about that forever. Uh, backlash. Um, you know, featured the, uh, you know, Cena and Edge last man standing match. You know, but Backlash was good. J- Judgment Day was in Chicago. That had a hot crowd. 
I thought it was good. See, no pay-per-view was really that bad. You know, Extreme Rules had the ladder match, and you had, you know, Jericho and Mysterio with, you know, Jericho ripping the mask off. That was good. Uh, you know, the Bash, the Bash would have been the worst pay-per-view of the year, but Jericho and Mysterio saved that pay-per-view's ass, really did. Uh, Night of Champions with, uh, you know, Punk and Hardy actually main event. That gave that show kind of a refreshing feel. Uh, SummerSlam had a hot opener with Mysterio and Ziggler. It had a really awesome main event with, uh, you know, Jeff Hardy and CM Punk in the, in the, uh, TLC match. Uh, breaking point. You know, the theme of this pay per view was like submissions. You had submission matches. You had uh, I quit matches. You know, the, you know, until someone reaches their breaking. They never did it again, but, you know, I thought the pay per view actually, um, it wasn't the worst pay per view of the year. I, I, I thought this would have been a lot worse than I remembered it, but, uh, it was actually pretty good. Uh, Hell in a Cell, I would say Hell in a Cell was the worst show of the year. Just because, you know, like nothing was, um, you know, the Hell in a Cell matches weren't bad. It's just the order of the uh, the match quality was just kind of weird. You know, I, I just, I, I, I remember True Slayer saying, I remember other people said this as well when it came out. If you just kind of reverse the order of this pay-per-view, which would have been so much better. I, I just wasn't a big fan of the whole DX and Legacy overbooking with, you know, Triple H getting locked out of the out of the cell. And then he had to find bolt cut. I guess it was bolt cutters to get himself back inside the cell that was it the hell in a cell matches the other thing is you couldn't use blood here so a lot of people felt like the the hell in a cell matches were very watered down and that's a lot of a lot of the other problem with the year as well a lot of people kind of felt like um you know guys bleeding in matches and them having to stop the matches because of blood kind of took away from a lot of the matches but in my opinion you know sometimes it kind of helped you know i remember punk and mysterio had a match in 2010 where they stopped the match and then punk you could just tell he got really pissed off and just started like whipping mysterio into the uh you know barricades with just so much more intensity because he was just pissed that they start stopped the match that happened with uh Shelton and christian when christian got busted open from the ladder so just a lot of that stuff went on as well bragging rights like i said guys that that was a good pay-per-view you know the iron man match between cena and orton was i thought it was pretty much great you had a, 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 a you know not a lot of filler on that show because of that survivor series they pushed new talent that was a great show so yeah man so no way out in survivor series i would say were the two best pay-per-views of the year right there the worst pay-per-view of the year i'd probably say you know hell in a cell the bash breaking point those would be the, th the three worst and then you had really you know just solid pay-per-views when you get to backlash judgment day extreme rules those are solid pay-per-views um so last part of the video top 10 matches of the year john cena randy orton from a uh, breaking point the i quit match great storytelling match these guys you know this is a war right here. It, it, I, I, I don't think I've ever seen this much drama uh, in a match in a really long time. Very, very dramatic. Very underrated, too. You know, I, I can see why some people don't like the match. It depends on how you feel on Cena and Orton. You know, it really does. Uh, number nine, Cena versus Edge from back, back, Backlash, Last Man Standing match. Now, let me say this about the match. The spots were great. Like, if you edit this match and edit out, edit the spots, you're like, man, they kept on doing spot after spot. I mean, you know, Cena attitude adjusting Edge and to the OVW guys who were, you know, acting like they were part of the crowd. And I always think it's funny how the OVW guys were always wearing WWE merchandise. Isn't that kind of funny? Uh, but yeah, you know, attitude adjustments off the top rope, you know, stuff with the pyro, uh, you know, Big Show coming out. And, and you know, th that, that was a brutal finish. You know, concertos, uh, a lot of great spots. But the problem with this match was the last man standing match is you just kind of knew they were building up to a great spot. So it was just kind of tough to get into it. Uh, number eight, Edge versus Jeff Hardy from Extreme Rules, the ladder match. Both guys put each other on the line. They killed each other. Just, uh, you know, you know, arguably the two MVPs of ladder matches, which is kind of tough to say because, you know, I'm not including Shawn Michaels or Rob Van Dam in there, but, you know, Edge and Jeff Hardy might have been the most creative guys with the ladders over the years. They've probably been in the most ladder matches. And um, number seven, I'm going to go with Jericho versus Mysterio from Extreme Rules. This is awesome because Jericho took off the, he said he was going to take off the mask and he took off Ray's mask and he's schoolboy Ray to get the victory. But Jericho Mysterio just had awesome chemistry. They had better matches this year when they're both in their, you know, mid thirties 
than when they were in their 20s in WCW. Uh, the matches they had in WCW were okay, but it wasn't to this level. Uh, number six, I'm going to go with the SmackDown Elimination Chamber. So Edge actually loses the title and gets surprised uh, by Jeff Hardy, uh, but Triple H wins the uh, title. I just thought you had, you know, Undertaker saved this match's ass. Undertaker looked great here. Him and Triple H... Uh, no, they don't have a good track record of matches. You know, they've had some, they've had some ups and downs. They had some good matches, WrestleMania X7. They had some bad matches, King of the Ring 2002. But, you know, they were able to show that chemistry here, which was, you know, fully, fully taken advantage of at, uh, WrestleMania 27 years down the road. But, you know, you had a lot of great kickouts from the pedigree, choke slams, last ride. Uh, I, th I think even Triple H kicked out of a tombstone, but uh, after like the second pedigree, Triple H actually pins The Undertaker then win back the WWE title. Uh, number five, John Cena, Randy Orton, bragging rights, one hour, Iron Man match, anything goes. Uh, that was a, that's when Cena won the title back, so I'll go with that at number five. Number four, CM Punk versus Jeff Hardy. The TLC match at SummerSlam. Number three, I'm going to go with the Raw Elimination Chamber from No Way Out. This match was great because Cena lost the title right away. You know, they I, I think Jericho did a code breaker. Mysterio did the 619. Edge did the spear. Three finishing moves to put Cena away as soon as he comes into the chamber. It was shocking. That, that, that might have been one of the hardest markout moments I've ever seen. And Edge's facial expression really he sold it very well. Uh, number two, Jericho versus Mysterio from the Bash. Awesome stuff, epic stuff. You know, they. I love. I love this feud because each and every match got better. They kept on building each and every match, and uh, you know, they they countered off of the uh, the mask stuff with Mysterio wearing a double mask. So when Jericho took off the mask, he was like, "Holy shit!" You know, he's got another mask on. What the fuck? But uh, yeah, just just great stuff. Just great counters from the six one nine into the walls of Jericho. Great counters of the walls of Jericho. Uh, great counters to the Lion Salt. Just, you know, these two guys were just awesome here. This is one of those matches that just, uh, you know, makes you love professional wrestling. It was that good. Uh, number one, Undertaker versus Shawn Michaels, WrestleMania 25. You guys know how good it is. You know, some people kind of compared this to, like, you know, some of the all Japan matches that they had in the 90s with the crash and burn spots. But, uh, yeah, man, the, uh, you know, Taker's facial expression on that one tombstone. When Sean kicks out, that might be like the best near fall ever to me. So, uh, so yeah, Undertaker, Shawn Michaels. It's kind of clear now. The WrestleMania 25 is still a lot better than WrestleMania 26. And that seems like everyone pretty much agrees with that. I mean, without a doubt, you know, probably the second, you know, it's either the first or second WrestleMania match of greatest WrestleMania match of all time. That's why some people are so high on it. So that's pretty much it, guys. That was the 2009 pay-per-view rewind. Let me know how you guys feel about the year. And uh, I'm out.